Men are smarter than women. But if this is true, then how come females have higher A-level scores in the UK? Checkmate, bigots. Oh dear. Well, before we go calling checkmate, let's just have a quick look over the facts, shall we? First of all, I think it would be interesting to actually examine this prevalent mainstream claim that girls are academically outperforming boys. You know, it's something that we constantly hear, headline after headline, about boys falling behind in education. But given that men surpass women in literally every avenue later in life, even in professions like nursing, which are overwhelmingly female-dominated... I have to wonder how accurate this gender gap in education really is. Secondly, I think it would be a good springboard to talk about a phenomenon that I've noticed, which I like to refer to as whataboutism. Now, as a quick overview, the British A-levels are any number of selective subjects that students choose for their last two years in high school. These subjects are all graded on a scale from A star, which is basically honours, down through A, B, C, D, E, and then jumps to U, which is essentially a failing grade. Now, where this claim about girls academically outperforming boys comes from is that if we average out the grades for all boys against all girls across their elective subjects, girls as a demographic appear to get better grades than boys. For instance, if we add up all of the honour students, there are more girls who receive A-star subject grades than boys. So, as if the obvious even needs to be stated, not all subjects are created equal. Thankfully, when I responded to this guy in the comments, he was kind enough to provide a few helpful links. And the very first link, which for some reason he thinks supports his position, starts by listing the most popular elective subjects for the British A-levels by gender. Quote, There were striking differences in the percentages of males and females taking certain subjects. At AS and A2 levels, boys were approximately three times more likely than girls to take physics and twice as likely to take maths and information communication technology. On the other hand, girls were approximately twice as likely as boys to take English literature, English language, psychology, sociology, and art and design, end quote. Yeah, imagine my surprise at these statistics. Girls are apparently academically outperforming boys, but I honestly have to wonder what that statement counts for when the A-levels are averaging boys who disproportionately do physics and maths against girls who disproportionately do art and sociology. This is another article the guy linked from The Guardian, which has an interesting paragraph that further exemplifies the problem. Quote, Data on entry numbers by gender shows computing to be the subject with the biggest disparity. 92.2% of entrants were boys. At the other end of the scale, 87.7% of performing and expressive art entrants were girls, end quote. For our convenience, the article contains a complete list of results by gender at the bottom, so let's just do some quick dirty napkin maths, shall we? Hypothetically, let's say that both subjects have 100,000 students. So if 92.2% of computing students are male, that means that there is a total of 92,200 male students, 3.4% of whom got the highest A-star marks for a total of 3,135 male honours students. And working through the same maths, there was 289 female computing honours students. Now, in performing and expressive arts, we have 87,700 female students, 4.1% of whom achieve the highest A-star marks for a total of 3,596 female honours students and only 283 male honours students. So if we now look at the gender totals across those 200,000 students, males have ended up with only 3,418 honours students against a total of 3,885 female honours students. Quick, stop the presses! Girls are academically outperforming boys! But are they? Is it actually fair to academically equate computer science grades to interpretive fucking dance? Now, this example is just two subjects that I've arbitrarily assigned student numbers to, so it's ultimately just a thought experiment to explain the underlying process of how these A-level averages are calculated. 
But moving beyond thought experiments, clearly there is a truly massive gender disparity in the elective subject selection by the British high school system's real world student body. Taking this method to its conclusion in the real world and proclaiming that girls are academically outperforming boys is quite a thing to say because frankly, I think if your academic average includes grades from subjects like drama class, then it doesn't mean jack fucking shit in terms of assessing male versus female intelligence. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You can carry on all day long about girls outperforming boys at the UK A-levels, but the fact remains that once these academically superior girls leave the comfort of the British high school system and get to Oxford University, they literally have to be given extra time on maths tests, otherwise they can't compete with the male students. Padding out female high school grades with bullshit subjects like art and drama may serve to keep the mainstream normies happy, but when those girls get out into the real world, novel, problem-solving intelligence, you know, the kind that boys happen to excel at, matters a whole lot more than dancing ability. To quote Ray Stance from Ghostbusters, Personally, I like university. They give us money and facilities. We didn't have to produce anything. You've never been out of college. You don't know what it's like out there. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. Although, for the sake of fairness and equal time, perhaps I should also quote 2016's female Ghostbusters. But my sexism. I digress. That Cambridge fact sheet tallying gender differences in A-level subject selection went on to say, quote, These differences in subject choices could have implications for social capital as there is evidence to suggest that taking A2 subjects such as maths and physics or those that lead to medicine tend to lead to higher earning power, end quote. Well, spank my ass and call me Charlie. Who would have thunk that despite girls on average supposedly outperforming boys in high school, the ability for those boys to specifically excel at harder subjects, which actually matter in the real world, will eventually lead to a gender earning gap in a global information technology based economy. Now, interestingly, this Telegraph article from 2014 talks about Ofqual, the qualifications watchdog, publishing a list of dozens of quote-unquote unusual courses that will be scrapped from the GCSE and A-levels within three years because of concerns that they lack academic rigour. These scrapped courses include home ec and film studies. Other subjects identified include performing arts, humanities, applied science, human biology, and environmental studies. Ofqual has also told exam boards that they must radically toughen up 73 other courses, including ancient history, business studies, classical civilization, economics, general studies, law, media studies, and psychology. You'll notice that a great many of these off-qual identified soft subjects which lack academic rigour just happen to be female favourites, purely by chance, I'm sure. So let's just count forward those three years, 2015, 2016, 2017. Right, what do you expect that we'll see in the 2017 A-level results? No, 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 have a guess. What? Boys overtake girls in top grades for the first time in years? What kind of evil, sexist, discriminatory black magic is this? Could it, could it possibly be that when we scrap academically lazy soft subjects so girls can't pad their grades, it turns out they're not actually outperforming boys? Could that be the answer? Could it be that boys are actually smarter? No, sh- surely not. Now, if we turn our attention across the pond for a moment, we see a slightly different trend on the American SATs. This is because rather than including bullshit subjects like performance and expressive arts as part of their academic average, the SAT test basically consists of a mathematics portion and a verbal portion, making it much closer to a traditional IQ test. And what do those results show? Well, colour me fucking surprised, boys outperform girls in maths by quite a large margin and have done so consistently for the last 50 years. 
This gender difference is consistent across all ethnic groups and is in spite of girls being overrepresented in advanced AP and honours maths classes, indicating that this underperformance in maths is an innate biological shortcoming of females, not the result of environmental factors like discrimination or subject preparedness. I'm pretty sure most people watching this video would have accurately guessed that that was going to be the result. But what's more interesting is the verbal portion of the test. Based on all the blah blah we hear about women being better communicators, you'd expect women would have the advantage on the verbal portions of the test. Well, the verbal results get a lot less publicity than the maths results, but the little I could find seemed to show that whilst the gap is nowhere near as wide and women did perform better on their verbal portion compared to their maths portion of the exam, men as a demographic still consistently outperformed women even at the verbal portions of the SATs. Men are objectively smarter than women, period. And not just in the highest percentiles, but on average. Pointing to the A-levels in the UK doesn't change this reality. A-levels that ultimately average grades from subjects like performance and expressive arts against subjects like computing tells us absolutely fucking nothing about male versus female intelligence. The comparison is beyond flimsy. And without even having to turn to more academically rigorous student assessments like the American SATs, even the A-level results themselves shift in favour of boys once some of those lazy, soft subjects are scrapped. The only way that girls are outperforming boys in education is through padded grades. Look, I am human. I have made mistakes in some of my videos. Beyond actual mistakes, a lot of what I talk about on this channel is speculative theory crafting, which often has a great deal of supporting evidence, but is rarely what could be described as definitive. I am certainly not above criticism. Criticism is good, even stupid criticism like this can be good because it ultimately got me to examine the British A-levels, compare them to American SATs, and now there's a Coltane video about it, so, you know, silver linings and all of that. But I do have to wonder about the general quality of most criticism I see. So much of it boils down to what I like to call whataboutism. It doesn't address any of the points raised in the video. It doesn't bring any great new insights to the topic. It doesn't even seem to be true once the actual evidence is examined. It's just, what about X? As if X, with no further explanation, is a magical catch-all argument that somehow negates every other aspect of the subject being discussed. What about the British A-levels? Yeah, what about them? Going over the numbers is somewhat interesting, but it really shouldn't take a fucking genius to immediately recognise the problem with averaging female arts and drama grades against male physics and maths grades. In a discussion about general intelligence, these higher female A-levels don't mean shit. And when some of these academically lazy soft subjects are scrapped, surprise, boys take the lead. Simply blurting out A-levels doesn't counter or disprove a fucking thing that was said in that video. Well, what about the fact that more men work in shittier jobs than women? What about it? Yeah, more men are working shitty, dangerous, low-paying jobs. You know what their female counterparts are doing? I'll give you a hint. They're not working better jobs than the men. They are doing nothing. Absolutely fucking nothing. Almost a third of all US households, single, cohabitating, married and other, feature a stay-at-home mother. These women are a useless, parasitic burden on society. Pointing out that more men work shit, menial jobs doesn't prove anything when a third of the women you are trying to compare them against aren't even adult enough to get off their fat, lazy asses and enter the fucking workforce. There was a ton on my female power fantasy video. What about Walter White? What about him? I mean, it's pretty clear to anyone who's actually seen Breaking Bad that White is not the good guy, and the show ultimately ends with him getting his just desserts, bleeding out on the floor surrounded by cops. I don't know a single guy who longingly fantasizes about that. I mean, do, do you really honestly think that character arc about a drug kingpin who poisons children and bombs nursing homes is the male equivalent to Dakota Johnson's character in How To Be Single? I mean, 
Something like The Wedding Crashes would have been a better example, but even in that film, it is made abundantly clear that Wilson and Vaughan's characters are horrible people, and the film is ultimately about them changing their caddish ways. It certainly doesn't end with them still being lecherous assholes, and Christopher Walken doesn't buy them houses in the Hamptons for fucking over his daughters. Whichever way you look at it, male and female film archetypes are just not comparable in this way. What about the popularity of MILF porn? What about it? It is a taboo sexual fantasy no different to women and their rape fantasies. You know what women don't like? Actually getting raped in real life. A successful 30-year-old guy who may occasionally spank it to some MILF porn doesn't actually want to settle down with a 45-year-old hag who's pregnant with another man's baby. Pornhub's most popular does not explain away this storyline. The, the point is just absurd. I mean, this nonsense goes back a long way. I remember one particularly bizarre comment left on my biology culture ideology video, ranting and raving about what a joke I am for talking about the pill because it was clearly all caused by the crack epidemic. What about the crack epidemic? Yeah, what about that crack epidemic that even a basic Google search would have revealed started in the early 1980s, two decades after the time period being discussed in that video? Now, You'd think, you would think that simply pointing out that his version of history was off by two decades would have been enough to settle the matter. Nope. 11 comments later, full of asinine nonsense about how the October Revolution in Russia and the Chinese Communist Revolution were apparently peaceful anti-war movements comparable to the free love pacifism of the American hippies in the 1960s. These are all undoubtedly stupid, ill-conceived arguments, but whenever I engage with these types of people, it turns out that it's not necessarily stupid people making them. I mean, they're absolutely wrong as fuck, but they do seem to have the brains and tenacity to continue arguing their wrong as fuck points to the last breath. I think the problem is ultimately more about ideology and ego than it is about honest appraisal of the facts. If I had to describe it, I would say it's a secular god of the gaps position. This kind of whataboutism is basically a desperate attempt to find any gap in the evidence they can to shoehorn their current belief system in and maintain their status quo position. I mean, just look at this guy. Checkmate, bigots. Honestly, think about that for a second. What kind of guy would unironically write that in his very first single sentence comment about girls on average doing better at the A-levels? Well, I would guess a guy whose mind is already made up and thinks he's won an argument without actually addressing any of the points that were brought up in the video he's commenting on and without any corroborating evidence to show how this A-level performance is actually calculated. I mean, this guy doesn't give a fuck that even a cursory assessment of the A-levels shows massive gender disparities across academically rigorous and academically lazy subjects, which renders it completely useless for coherently assessing general intelligence between the genders. He doesn't care because in his head, he has already won the battle and the war before it even started. This one little factoid he's desperately clinging to, which ironically commits the exact same fallacy as the long-debunked gender pay gap, th this little factoid is his god of the gaps that somehow invalidates literally everything else that we know about male versus female intelligence. IQ results, gender participation in mentally rigorous STEM fields, patent filings, esports, and even other more rigorous student assessments like the SATs, which, unlike the A-levels, don't skew their results by including grades from drama class. But he's got his one little factoid that he's sticking to, which in his head proves that he's right and the whole rest of reality is wrong. You know, if the world's round, then how come I don't roll down the side and fall off into space? Checkmate, Galileo. It's absolute crap. But it's the kind of bullheaded, willfully ignorant, barely relevant, single-issue crap that I constantly see being thrown around all the time. A-levels, Walter White, MILF porn, the crack epidemic. As I said, 
I am human. I make mistakes. I'm certainly not above criticism, but none of these comments are good counter arguments against any of the topics raised in any of the videos they were posted on. In fact, when you consider the dates for the crack epidemic and the preferred A-level subjects by gender, a great many of these whataboutisms don't just fall short of good criticism, they are actually absurd and contradictory even as standalone statements. I guess the real question is though, what do you do about these people and how do you adequately address their whataboutisms? The way I see it, it's kind of an economic trap. These whataboutisms are seemingly simple, often only a sentence long, but ultimately take way, way more than a single sentence to unravel and address point by point. And it usually results in a completely fruitless exchange anyway. Very few disagreements are ever actually resolved, especially when you're talking with disingenuous ideologues who've already made up their mind no matter what. For example, my point questioning the A-levels as an accurate measurement of future ability, given that once outside the safety of British high schools, these supposedly superior girls need to be given extra time on university maths tests, which A-level guy here repeatedly and dare I guess willfully misinterpreted as me actually claiming that girls got extra time on their A-level exams, complete with him demanding evidence for a claim that I quite obviously never made. If you try to honestly address these kind of ideological zealots, a stupid single sentence claim suddenly turns into 18 comments full of flagrantly dishonest horse shit. You may just be thinking, why even bother with these people? And if I'm being honest, I can't help it. Sometimes sanctimonious retards like this just get under my skin and, you know, that's my own fault for losing my cool and wasting time on them. But frankly, as long as you're putting any ideas out into the public space, I'm not sure you can actually avoid these people because these kind of retards actually seem to represent the majority of critical discourse. It really struck me while I was watching the Jordan peterson Kathy Newman debate. The unfortunate fact is that if Peterson wants to get on national television and lay out the scientific facts of human behavioural biology, that invariably necessitates dealing with a television host like Kathy Newman or someone else just like her. Now, to be fair, I think Peterson did the best he could with what he was dealt, but it kind of highlights why I don't like debates and why I think they are just a really terrible platform for exchanging or challenging ideas. Put yourself into Peterson's shoes. You're in the middle of explaining some trait about human nature, like the scientifically observable gender differences in agreeableness, one of the five-factor personality traits. And Newman interrupts saying, well, that's a bit of a generalization. Yes, yes, Kathy, it is a generalization, but in this case, the generalization was accurate. What Peterson was saying was scientifically correct. But seriously, what is he actually supposed to do in that situation? He's got two options as far as I can see. He can either let that complaint slide, which is what he did, or he can let the debate get derailed by spending 20 minutes trying to explain how statistics and peer-reviewed science works to a woman who clearly has zero interest in scientific accuracy and ultimately objected to what he was saying on the basis of feelings rather than facts anyway. I guess there is a third option. Peterson could have just called Kathy Newman a stupid idiot and made fun of her for not understanding statistics. But belligerence rarely wins over the minds of a debate audience either, especially if that audience is as statistically and scientifically illiterate as Newman herself. To use a chess metaphor, Peterson had to sacrifice a pawn to save the queen. Kathy Newman either goes unchallenged and wins a debate point in the eyes of the audience, or Peterson wastes 20 minutes of national television time trying to explain basic statistics and the scientific method, which could have been better spent talking about other more pressing issues. Basically, what I am getting at is that Peterson did his level best, but doing your level best is pointless if you are not on a level playing field. 
A public debate is a lose-lose situation for anyone who goes in with honest intentions. The best that you could hope for in that situation is that the audience watching would recognise Kathy Newman for the bullshit she was shilling. But I honestly think that would be giving normies way too much fucking credit. Whilst I have seen a lot of statistically and scientifically aware guys, and a few girls, calling out Newman for her dishonest tactics, the real problem is that most other people aren't statistically or scientifically aware. See, most people do understand generalizations intuitively. They intuitively understand that there are some general differences between men and women. However, the problem with this intuitive understanding versus a scientific understanding is that people's intuitive understanding tends to only extend as far as things they agree with. For example, people intuitively understand men are stronger than women, which is why we have gender segregated sports without too many complaints, even from angry radical feminists. But as soon as people hear that men are smarter than women, which easily explains why 90% of Fortune 500 CEOs are men, that intuition they once had dissolves into cries of sexist misogynistic discrimination. As Psychological Cynic pointed out in his recent video, Kathy Newman repeatedly made her own generalizations about women, grouping them together and generalizing them under umbrella issues like, why should women as a group put up with the wage gap? It was only when it came to generalizations about women she didn't like that she threw a spanner in the works and claimed that generalizations were not allowed. Now, I don't know anything about Kathy Newman's educational background, and frankly, I don't care enough to actually look it up, so I can't definitively say whether she is actually ignorant about statistical generalizations or whether she was just feigning ignorance as a dishonest debate tactic. But I do know from personal experience that even normies who do or at least should logically understand statistics often engage in the same fallacies. I was once talking to a journalist I know, this is a 100% true story. I was talking about how marriage is a failed institution in the 21st century and how 50% of marriages end in divorce. By the time you get to marriage number three, the failure rate is like 75%. If your wife starts bringing in 60% of the household income, the chances that she'll divorce you goes up by 40%. You know, the actual facts. And this whole time, this guy is visibly getting more and more agitated until the point that he eventually snaps and basically says, I don't care what you're saying, your statistics are bullshit. When I get married, it's going to work out just fine and your statistics can't disprove that. This is a guy with a university degree in political journalism. He had to do statistics as part of his degree and reports on them daily as part of his job. And even he turns into a knuckle-dragging retard that argues purely on the basis of feelings when he hears something that he doesn't like about his future relationship prospects. And for some additional context, this journalist wasn't directly invested in the institution of marriage. He wasn't engaged or anything. He actually wasn't even dating anyone at the time. His reaction to the clear statistical facts of modern marriage was based on pure fantasy about an ideal dream relationship that he might hypothetically have in the future. I mean, how the fuck do you even respond to that? I, you can't reasonably debate with someone like that. No amount of factual evidence is ever going to overrule their feelings. And, and this is a guy with a fucking degree in political journalism. Dispassionately reporting on these kind of social statistics is supposed to be the guy's job. That being the case... How do you think the average ignorant left-wing normie who watches Channel 4 would have interpreted that Newman-Peterson debate? It's all good and well for a small YouTube community to point and laugh, but I suspect the majority of people who saw that debate on television would have probably sided with Newman. Ultimately, the problem is bigger than a few whataboutism retards engaging in YouTube comment sophistry. It's something that I have briefly touched on before, and it's the issue of echo chambers versus open discourse. There is a truly fundamental problem that nobody is willing to address, least of all the rationalist, skeptic, egalitarian, classical liberal culture warriors trademark. That problem? 
The so-called marketplace of ideas does not necessarily appear to be a free market. There are quite obviously some very strong biologically ingrained market distortions. Certain ideas based on feelings are seen by the majority as inherently more valuable in the marketplace of ideas than other more uncomfortable ideas that happen to be based on fact. Most obviously in this case, nothing negative can ever be said about women regardless of the facts. Certain scientific studies have even peripherally touched on quantifying this market distortion. Like the famous gender in-group bias study, which found that all else being equal, women showed an automatic in-group bias towards each other, opting to favour women in four out of the four experiments. Conversely, men showed a strong out-group bias also favouring women in three out of the four experiments. If we count the genders separately and thus take all eight experimental scenarios into account, that basically means that you are automatically starting off with a seven to one innate bias against you if your position is interpreted as being against women. In terms of honest debate and public discourse assessing the scientific facts, that is a problem. And I don't know that it is a problem which can be overcome with any amount of reasonable dialogue. Don't get me wrong, I am not arguing in favour of echo chambers. I am not saying to cut yourself off and ignore anyone and everyone who offers criticism or takes issue with what you say. But... By the same token, in the absence of a formally established echo chamber, I still really don't see any actual honest dialogue happening in the public space. Whether it's a national television host like Newman intentionally misinterpreting Peterson's point about lobsters, or it's some anonymous YouTube commenter intentionally misinterpreting my point about university maths tests, it seems to be the exact same dishonest bullshit from the very top right down to the bottom of the barrel. It's all just ill-conceived, time-wasting whataboutism. God of the gaps, filibustering, and it all makes me wonder if it's even worth engaging with these people. I mean, yeah, like I said, even retarded criticisms like the one about A-levels can lead to new avenues of information, but at the same time, it was hardly a relevant counter-argument to what was actually said in my video, and the back-and-forth exchange that followed was hardly fruitful. So, in terms of best outcomes, at some point it has to be asked, whilst you're strategically sacrificing a pawn to save the queen, is it strategically beneficial to be playing that game in the first place? When you really stop and think about it in terms of overall cost benefit, is it actually in Jordan Peterson's best interest to try and get onto a mainstream television program where the lying, disingenuous host spends the entire time misrepresenting his points to a Channel 4 audience of normies who are probably just as retarded as she is? Or are Peterson's time and efforts better spent just focusing on his lectures and writing his books for the people who will honestly assess his ideas? Is it worth politically campaigning to reform a fundamentally broken family court system so corrupted by innate biological female favouritism that guys are being ordered to pay additional alimony funds to their ex-wives 15 years after the divorce because she is a fiscally irresponsible lady child who squandered all the money she was originally given? Or is it better to just preventatively tell any guys who are willing to listen, hey, don't get married, look at all of these statistics, it's an objectively bad choice, and if you still decide to go through with it, that's fine, but that's on you. Don't come back crying about it later on. Honestly, I don't know. It's ultimately up to every individual to decide on the cost benefit of their own actions, but personally, I, for one, will be striving to waste less time on these kind of idiots in future. In 1417, Francesco Barbaro coined the term the Republic of Letters. What he meant by this was that despite the different nationalities he and his intellectual peers geographically belonged to, they also belonged to a higher republic that superseded the mere borders of nations. By the sharing of letters and the ideas therein, Barbaro and his colleagues belonged not to a geographic nation, but rather a metaphysical nation of ideas. With the internet, I think this republic of letters is relevant now more than ever. 
You are never going to capture the mainstream. I'm sorry, but you just aren't. You are not going to change the cultural zeitgeist or change the judicial laws into whatever idealistic utopia you have in mind. The Overton window is never going to shift as far as you want it to, especially when certain commonly accepted beliefs are underpinned by things like biological reproductive limitations that automatically lead to female deference and favoritism. I know this is not what most of the culture war types of people want to hear, but honestly, I think the best you can ever hope for and strive towards is a republic of letters. An online space relatively unmolested by the mainstream, where ideas can be openly shared with those who are at least willing to listen to the facts. In the end, I think everyone would probably be better off just focusing on their own community of ideas, rather than spending so much time and energy trying to defeat feminism by winning over the hearts and minds of the mainstream normie retards.